Happy second day of Connect Tech. Everybody excited? Woo, no, woo, no, woo. Oh my goodness, woo. What I say? I'm glad everybody's enjoying, taking the opportunity out to learn. And so um, today we're going to be chatting about remote state in React. Um, and so just a little introduction. I'm Jarrell. I'm an engineering manager at Chromatic. You can follow me on social media at the Fryer, T H A, instead of T H E. You know, I try to be cool. Um, follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or GitHub. And so at Chromatic, we work on open source product called Storybook. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's a front end tool for building UI components faster and easier. Along with that, we also have a closed source product called Chromatic, which we add a lot of different you know, tooling around Storybook to help you leverage Storybook better. That's like UI review, UI testing, publishing and sharing and hosting your Storybook, and also leveraging act, GitHub action checks to validate that your stories or your components are working correctly. All right, so I'm going to dive right in. I always like to start these off with a cool little quote. And this quote is by Marshall McLuhan, and it says, Ed, we shape our tools, and afterwards, our tools shape us. As developers, engineers, we create a lot of new and interesting technology. It provides new functionalities and capabilities that really push us into innovation. And after coming up with these new innovations, they stick with us for the long haul. These tools innovations stick around until we're able to really come up with something else, right? The trajectory of front-end development has largely been driven by the developers trying to find the best way to render their applications in the browser. I remember the early days of Angular. Uh, its main attraction was the strong opinions, right? Like you had to write this code, this Angular app, the Angular way. And then React hops on the scene, right? offering this new declarative shiny magic that is highly flexible and people can build apps in any way that they desire. And then Vue pops up, right? Vue is like, we're the best of both worlds, right? You got these strong, loosely held opinions, um, flexibility, and the ability to be adopted incrementally. And then Spelt comes and says, you know what? The compile stuff is really important, right, when we're building applications. And then there's new guy on the scene called Solid JS who's like really about reactivity. And so all of these different ways of building applications have shaped us. They've shaped how we've looked at building our applications and pushing our applications to the next step. And they've made us pause in a moment to take opinions about how we build applications, right? All of us, I imagine most of us in here use React predominantly, right? If you don't use create React predominantly, raise your hand. Cool, got a few people, that's, that's, that's good to hear. And so a lot of people use React predominantly and some don't, right? But these tools have shaped us and formed our opinions about how and why we build software, right? And so when we're thinking about these opinions with React, there are so many options, so many opinions to define when building an application. And one area that engineers have a myriad of ways for determining an opinion about how to, do the, how to do things in applications is managing state, right? When we think of state, we think of it being, you know, the current, the current look of an app or the current, um, I don't want to say state for the word, for the sake of, I've already used state, but the current way it feels, the way it looks, the way it behaves, right? That's what we think about when we think of state. And there's so many different flavors, so many different ways. It's like being in an ice cream shop. Right, so many flavors to choose from. You can have cookies and cream. You can have uh, some people like a Rocky Road, or if you're a Tom, uh, Ben and Jerry's, I think there's the half baked now out there. You know, there's so many flavors of ice cream, and React is just like that. So many different ways to, to build your application. So many different libraries to choose from. And you're just like, why should I do this one? It feels like overload coming in your brain, right? And state is the same way. There's so many different places to put it. You can put it in a URL. You can put it in the browser storage APIs, like local storage, session storage, cookies. Uh, you can, with React, you can use hooks, context, refs. State can be stored in so many ways just within a React application. Uh, state can be local to specific co components, or it can be needed to be globally accessed. So many flavors of state. React's like the ice cream shop. And so all these options really make you stop to think about how you build your applications. Now the question I ask, and I want to ponder the room, how many people 
build an application today that does not call out to a back end. Okay, that's one. Now watch this. How many people build an application today that calls the back end? I want to raise your hands again. How many people build an application that calls the back end? I look around the room at the hands. The likelihood of an application being built today that does not need to persist some state in a remote way is highly unlikely. All right? And so because of this, there's so many things that come into building application, but typically the most important piece is how do I call my back end? How do I deal with asynchronous remote data? How do I deal with asynchronous remote data? I love how Corey House, uh, he had this nice little tweet that went out the other day as I was getting ready getting this presentation ready. And it, it made me think about some things for state. It says, he said, a simple rule set for handling React state, right? Start local. So that could be like using use state hook or you know, you're just storing some state in that local component. If some children of that component need it, just pass it down via prop. Uh, parents and siblings need it, just hoist it up to the parent and then pass it down via prop. <laughs> and then if it's remote state, he said use React query, we'll come back to that in a moment. And if there's any global state left, consider you know, React context or some third party libraries such as Jotai, Zustan, and Redux, and et cetera. The, the, the myriad of all the libraries that are state management. There's a few, few prevailing statements that I gathered from this tweet. It's co-locate state. So wherever state's needed, put it there, all right? Another thing is I got from this tweet is like he, he one, two, three, four, five imply an order that you should look at in building your application to determine where to put state, all right? And so essentially what he's saying, if you look at four and five, he says, don't use a third part library until you need it, all right? That's essentially what he's saying. And this last thing that he, this is really interesting to me is that he's implying, Corey's implying that remote state is a challenging problem and you should reach for a third party library. When I look at item four, Corey implies remote state is not a problem that's easily solved using the basics of React. Now, why do I agree with him? For starters, with remote state, your UI, your front end is not the source of truth. No matter how you put it in your front end, it's, it's not, it's not the source of truth. Your front is lying to you if it says so, <laughs> right? And so this, this state is persisted remotely in a location that you do not control or own, all right? And so it implies that there's shared ownership, that this data can be changed by other people without you really knowing. Uh, this, this data can potentially become out of date if you're not careful. And then watch this, once you grasp this, this nature of how service state in your applications work, even more challenges start to arise. For example, caching. <laughs> Imagine that it's probably the hardest thing to do in programming. I worked for a company where we were building mobile applications and there could be hundreds of thousands of millions of users using these applications at one time. If we did not cache this data, our backends would be under heavy load. And it would, cost, it would be a pretty high bill. And so we had to think about caching this data. How do we, how do we cache it? Uh, another thing is like deduping requests. You know, when you could be on the same one page, you could be making the same API call out multiple times and not know it. How do you dedupe those? And then there's like knowing when the data's out of date. When do I need to call the back end to get new data? You don't know that as a front end automatically, right? You gotta figure out how the data is out of date. Uh, you got performance optimizations like pagination and lazy loading data, right? Managing memory and garbage collection of service state. Memoizing these results, right? There's so many concerns about service state that if we try to sit here and solve the problem, we build out a really complex front end that people coming behind us likely will struggle to understand, all right? 
And so the question becomes now, how have we done this historically and react, right? How have we done this historically and react? And so if you're looking at a react component, and some of us have probably written something like this before, where there's either, you know, three used state hooks or there's a reducer, and then I have this nice little uh, fetcher function that calls out an API, makes a request to the API, and I'm setting some state in my component, and whether it's successful or not, I set an error, or I set what is success, and then based off those different statuses, I render something in my component. How many of us write, how many of us have written something like this before? Actually, second question, how many of us have seen tutorials write things like this before? <laughs> All right, and so this right here, when you think about it, that's a lot of complexity going on. There's opportunities for this, these different three states here to get out of sync. And so how do I keep them in sync? If I don't have a little bit more complexity going, I could change it to a reducer, of course. That might help. But then you got, how do I cache it? What if I want to paginate it? How do I track all the pagination state? A lot of different things start to come up that, comp that make this component now utterly highly complex. And watch this. This is just looking at it here, and you're just like, that's probably a lot to, 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 to grasp and understand. And so now I, I want to present an option to you to try, if you're not trying it now, enter TanStack query, what used to be called React query, <laughs> but TanStack query for the purpose of this presentation, right? And so before I go back into, go into React query a little bit more in detail, there's more options for doing this outside of React query. If you're using Redux already now today, there's a um, library called RTK query, which does something quite similar. If you're um, you know, into the Next.js Vercel ecosystem, they have their own tool called SWR, um, which is also you know, working on this, using this pattern that we like to call stale while we validate, which is essentially an HTTP and validation cache strategy that just essentially says if this data is stale, call it to the back end and give me some new data. And just establishing a protocol or paradigm for doing it. And so these all, all these libraries, they kind of solve that stale about while we validate pattern. And so the thing about React Query that I love is that it's declarative and automatic. You tell Tanstat React Query where to get your data and how fresh you need it to be, and the rest is pretty automatic. It handles caching, background updates, and stale data out of the box without zero configuration. Another thing about React Query, there's no global state that you need to be trying to manage. No reducers, normalization systems, heavy configurations to understand. Simply pass a function that resolves your data or throws an error, and the rest is history. Another thing about it, it's configurable down to a, a very low level of how these queries work, right? It comes with dedicated dev tools, infinite loading APIs, first class mutation tools that make updating data within your apps a breeze. So don't worry, though, all these defaults are configured for you already, right? You can, you can tweak them, but there's some same default set that are aggressive, but allow you to have best practices within your app. So watch this, we're gonna go back to this previous slide. You remember this guy? That we struggled to understand, and that's like, how do, like all this, all this code, that's, a, that's, a, that's I'm using to try to get third party data. Imagine what this looks like with React Query. Oh, I just saw mine just go blow. I, I did the same thing as the first time I ran into this. This just become, became a whole lot more simpler to read and understand. Watch this. So anytime I write a query using React Query, there's a couple of different like parts of this that I get returned from this hook. I get a status that says what is loading, or it's in an error state, or if it's been successful. I get an error. This is defaults to null if it's been successful or undefined if it's been successful. And that error returns back whatever error my query function is throwing. And then I get the data. All right, there's a data key that just holds all the data that comes back from my query. And so now I have this query key, this query function. And look at how many lines just changed between this and that. 
with a clear, concise API that's simple to read and understand. All right? And so let me explain a little bit about what the query key and the query function do. Anytime I want to cache something, I got to be able to know how to get it out of the cache, right? I have to know how to access it from that cache. The query key is how React Query goes and establishes the cache to access specific items. And so this, this is what makes React Query super powerful. Because of this key, it says, if I have post, I, if I update this query key, or if I recall, refetch this query, I can now access this query function later down within React Query using just the key, and I'll show this a little bit later. Another thing that's like, if I set this query key to post, comma one within that array, or I, then I had multiple options that were like post, comma two, post, comma three, I can invalidate all the data that's related to post, and I'll show that also a little later. It's gonna be pretty cool, you're gonna be like, what? But yeah, and so, pretty cool, and that query function just simply needs to be a, a function that returns a promise. So you can do anything outside of remote state also, it just needs to be a function that returns a promise. All right, so let's dive in to some code. Y'all like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he's gonna throw a browser up here, and I can't believe it either. All right. And then let me set my screen to mirror. All right, so I have a nice little application look using the Rick and Morty API. Everybody familiar with Rick and Morty? No, nah, go watch, it's cool little cartoon, anyway. <laughs> and so one thing that I wanna call it, I'm using the traditional way of calling APIs, okay? I'm using where you just go out and you're making these calls to get this whole list of characters and, you, and a little bit later, you might make a sub call, a waterfall call to go get all the episodes. And so what I want to show here, in the network tab, if I refresh here, and if you're wondering what browser I'm using, I'm using this new browser called Arc by the browser company. Go check it out, it's pretty cool. Anyway, and so here you'll see that I made an API call out using the character API from Rick and Morty, and I get all these results, all right? Now, let's go look at what this code looks like. If I look at what this traditional code for getting these characters, there's this nice little fetcher function again that we just talked about with all this loading state and whatnot, and that's how my code looks, all right? We're going back, and now let's go look at this using React Query, using our React Query example, all right? And so, this is the same example. React Query, when you're developing React Query, they have this nice little dev tool that you can use and put in your apps. And you can hide it in production environments, so you can enable in production environments as you see fit. But you can come in here and play around with these queries and see how they work. And so now you see there's this query key that's in the cache called characters. And I'll come back and show the code here in a second. As this query key in the cache called characters, and you can see the, the response from the API, which has this info where it needs, if I could establish this using pagination if I wanted to, but you also see the results here, okay? And so like I can, from this query tool, I can trigger a refetch and then validate it, say this cache is set, I can reset it, which essentially just saw like a nice little quick re-render, or watch this, I can remove it. And now I need to refresh, and there it is again, all right? Now what does this look like in the code again? That's what we all care about, right? It's always about the code. And there it is again, a very simple ergonomic hook. And this is all the data fetching log logic just to do that page. The rest of this is rendering logic. I'm going 
looping over that results map, rendering each item, okay? Now, that's just a simple example of how this works, all right? Let's go back and let's look at this guy here, okay? On this page, you see, I have this nice fella here, Rick Sanchez, and if, as you see, there's duplicate information on this page. Y'all see it? It's all the same information, just rendered twice. Now, what do you expect to happen in the, in the, in the network console? And it, it's a question to the crowd. What do you expect to happen? Somebody says, I, respect, I expect two requests. Let's refresh and see. Oh, there it is. There's one. There it is again. All right? And we see, if you wrote scrolling through the list, I know it's going pretty fast, probably giving you whiplash. But we see a lot of these requests to just what? Repeat it. All right? And React query is not happening on this page. Now watch what happens when we go at React query. All right, besides the UI is different. Don't worry about that. Now you see here, that's all the API calls that are being made right here in my nice little dev tool. But in the network tab, let's refresh. All the APIs are calls are only made how many times? One. And I got him on this page how many times? Twice. And now, just so, you, just so I'm not fooling you and showing you that I'm actually rendering this code twice, let's look at the code. And so I have a traditional not dedupe request going out here. And so this is the traditional character pay function right here. And you see that I'm making this nice little fetch logic that we don't really like. I have this, it's right here in this traditional character component. And then I have that rendering how many times? Twice. So that's why the first time we saw all those API calls made twice. In the dedupe version, same thing with this React query API. And I'm rendering that same component how many times? Twice. So React query versus that, if we were doing this on our own, managing this remote state on our own, those requests will be going out twice. Let's say I put that on the page an infinite amount of times here. Let's see how much this slows down. I won't say infinite amount of times, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it a lot. All right, let's go back over here and see what happens. Now let's close this and refresh it. We saw how much long, you, you saw a nice little pause for the loading that happened there. Now watch, let's see if what happens if we do the same thing on the dedupe. Oh, I gotta do this using this one. Can't just copy and paste. All right. Now, go into my nice little dedupe one. Still got my loading. One API call. Versus, look at that. Think about if I'm doing this, think about if we make the mistake and we render the same, we're rendering the same ID a bunch of times on one page. Think about how much load that could put on our server. And think about how React Query is making that easy on our server and our backend people start to love us because our apps seem more performant. All right? And so React Query helps dedupe requests. Now the next, the next thing you have to stop and think about, if I have this data, what happens if I need to change it? Right? You know, if, I, if I'm rendering something, 
And we're talking about apps. There's always the read, but the read is often not the most important part of the app. It's the create, the update, delete. It's the mutation. That's what, we, that's what actually makes the app happen. All right? And so how does the React query help out with that? All right. Well, let's look at some code here. React query has this nice little thing I like to call the use mutation hook. And so with the use mutation hook, essentially, all you need to call, add is a mutation function. It will mute and it will essentially be the same thing as if we were just making this post call, right? Now this works a lot more powerfully when we combine it with the context of a query key, all right? And you're all like, all right, what is this magic that's happening now? Pro tips here. So what I have here is I have an optimistic update happen. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show the, the UI for what's happening. When we think of optimistic updates, I am, make, I am getting ready to do an API call, but I'm optimistically showing the UI on the front end before I actually get a response on the back end. Make sense, everybody? It makes sense, everybody? That's not familiar with optimistic updates? Cool, all right? And so that's what optimistic update is. With the React query, it makes doing those really easy. All right? And so like I just said, there's a mutation function, which you have to use mutation. You add information to it, where you make your API call. And so there's this on mutate function, which is like a callback. Not like a callback, it is a callback. Where after you trigger the mutation, there's a bunch of different steps run after the callback. Now, what, how do I trigger the mutation? Well, a mutation has this mutate function on it, all right? And so after you create the mutation hook, what you'll essentially do is call the mutate function. And so I can make this a lot more pretty if I did something like this. And then let's do reloading. All right. And so let me use mutation hook to expose the mutate function, which you can rename it how you want it to be to fit your domain so it reads a little bit better while you're looking at the component. And so whenever I submit this form here, which you're about to see in a second, question, go ahead. Can I submit one? Yeah, I'm about to submit one, just now, in a second. When I submit this, you're gonna see what happens here, all right? So I'm going to go to my nice little mutation page. And so this is the mutation without the optimistic update. So now you see to those is an empty array. Everybody sees that? Empty array. And so now when I create a new guy here, Let's see, I got a little email. I'm gonna do j at jownstheworld.com. Create. Oh, I'm on the wrong link, sorry. Let's see what that path is. Optimistic. So now, let me refresh again, just so we can work. And so now we see we have this breakfast object here. There's one item in here. Food, I click create again. It adds another item here. Johnny, that's another item there. And so all this comes from, I have a query, I'm using React query with this to-dos key. React query is managing a cache for me that has this information inside of it. Still, ma it's making API calls out like I normally would, but it's managing this information. And every time I mutate, what I'm doing is I'm going ahead and updating it 
sending it out to the back end. And it's making an API call out to the back end. As you see, when I refresh it now, I'm refreshing my page, and guess what's still there? All three of those items. All right? Cool. So, what all can I do with React Query? That's, that, that comes to the next question, right? What all can I do? And so, I pull up the website. With the React Query, you can even make API calls to your GraphQL APIs. Anybody in here using GraphQL currently? Yeah. Anybody's using GraphQL or using Apollo? Yeah, I, I do too. I use GraphQL and I use Apollo as well. You can use the React Query with, the, with your GraphQL APIs. You write your query, you call out your API like you normally would, make a request out, and you can use it just the same. It has, you can use it even with the React Native apps, right? It's not using specifically anything about React web or the website versus mobile, right? So you can use it in your React Native apps. I'll take a step further. You can use it agnostic of the framework. It's new now. You don't even have to be writing React to use it now. You can use it in Vue, SolidJS, Svelte soon, React, right? And so you can do all these things and use it in those, those apps. Now here's something that's really cool, and there's this paginated, this, this paginated um, option of doing it. So if you had a paginated API where you're fetching projects that use a page here, as you see, you just change the page. With React Query, all you essentially need to do is use this keep previous true variable and just increment the page. You see, all they're doing is changing the page in that state. It's the only local state they have. They change that value. They keep incrementing that value. You're keeping the previous data in your UI. React Query is doing all that plumbing for you. And you get a simple API, a simple front end hook for managing your paginated APIs without all the headache of how do I manage all this state. All right? That's a really cool option there. Um, if you're doing, you can do prefetching. All right? And so what is prefetching? Prefetching is, you know, when you look with APIs and web pages, you can try and Fetch the data before you actually need it, really simply, using React Query. It's pretty cool. You can actually set the data that's in the cache if you need to do it. And so that's what I'm doing here when I do optimistic updates. Right here in optimistic update, I'm counseling the query before it makes it out to the back end. In this case, I'm counseling because I don't have a true back end. But here, I will get the current query data and I use set query data to update that key with the previous information and my new information, all right? And so at the end of all this, this is how I do the um, optimistic update, but at the end of all this, this on settled callback does an invalidate queries call, which is simply says anything in my cache invalidate it and call the API again. And so how, do, how, does, how does it all come together and come to play, all right? I have my query. It calls out, gets information. Let's say I need to make a change. I call my mutation, mutation.mutate function, in this case, add to do. Whenever I call add to do, there's callbacks that are called. So on mutate, if I want to do some interesting things after it mutates, or I, right after I trigger this function. So I, here I can cancel the actual API call out to the back end first and do an optimistic update. And then once everything's done, I can have this own subtle callback that actually triggers the API call out to the back end because I invalidated the query. And if I have an error, here's the cool thing, if I have an error, guess what I can do? I can just send it back to the previous data. data. 
right? And so a lot of cool things here are happening with React Query that we get out of the box that makes our lives a whole lot easier. I think a cool thing, if, you, if you're deciding to want to use React Query, their website, or it's called Tanstack Query now, um, I guess I'm, I've gotten aged out of the, to the new world, to the new version. I guess I need to update my language. And so there's all these options and information, really robust documentation on how to use React Query. Uh, a cool thing I would say, if you decide you wanna leverage it, come here and look at this page. There are so many options that provide a lot of different power for you. Now, I'm, funny thing, a lot of people don't understand that React Query handles retries for you. Oh yeah, I know that perked in someone's head, perked up in some people's ears. If it fails, React Query will keep retrying if you set the amount of retries. By default, it's set, it's set to three, I think. Excuse me, no. By default, I believe it's set to true. You know, I have to come back to you and, I, and I'll, I'll confirm that by a little later. But there's a set of a number of retries that you can actually set to keep trying over and over until you get, if you don't get a success back, you actually finally throw the error. And so anybody that's ever done retrying in their apps knows how hard it is. It takes a lot of effort to actually manage what retry am I on? Am I over the amount of retries that I want to set? And so my app now becomes so much more complex. But React Query handles that for you. Another cool thing is there's this enabled option key. And so you can make queries dependent upon your app being in a certain state. Simplifying that without needing to add a use effect hook, not needing to manage a whole lot of other state, you can say, I only want this query to run if I set it to true. So we'll, we'll, go, we'll, go, we'll go do this example real quick. And so let's go to our deduct. And so I can add this guy here, false. All right, and so now if I go to deduct, let's refresh our page. This app is just sitting in a loading state because it's waiting on me to say we can actually enable this query. So watch this. I'll go ahead and do something like that. And so what I'm doing here, I'm just going to go here and add a nice little button. I can add a little button here, the on click. I can set the enable query. And then we'll do this guy here. So if I go back to deduct, here yeah, I should have a nice little button. Oh, I got to give my button some context. Oh, it says loading. Yeah. So I go back over here to my deduct guy. And this is why you don't do live coding, people. So if you ever do a, if you ever do a presentation, that's my, that's my nice little lesson to all of you. Ah, thank you. 
But either way, if I did this guy here, and I said the true now, proves the same point, I can enable and disable this query at will. And so that's really powerful when you start thinking about like, I only want to make this API call in these cases. So if I go back to the, go back to the nice little React query API, there's a, a lot of these defaults here, a lot of these options that are set, and, and they're same defaults, right? If you go through, you'll see some different nice little defaults that are aggressive, but they make your app performing as you will. You can tweak these to your desire to get an app into the state that you want it to be in order to um, make those API calls out without adding all of that complex logic to your app yourself and manage it. And so, as I say, in conclusion, close it on out. I go back to this nice little presentation. There's a lot of resources out there if you want to want to learn how to use React Query and um, use it in your apps and leverage it and get all the power that's there for it. Um, you can go look at the Tanstack docs. I strongly suggest going and look at TK Dodo's blog on Practical React Query. He has a lot of gems in that that are like super helpful for like if you decide you really want to leverage this. And here's a fun fact about React Query. You don't have to change your current state management library to use it. If you're using React Redux, you can throw this in there. Just at some point, just pull out the data fetching code that you're using for Redux and use this. Go ahead. What is that to put the data? Yeah, like is the data in a JS object? Is it local storage, special storage? Where does it actually put the data? That's a great question. And so React Query has an in-memory cache, if that makes any sense. So like the library itself is, is spinning up like a small in-memory cache in the browser. And so within that cache, it's saving that data here and there. So what you can do, and as you'll see here, there's, if you go down a little further here. So can, you, can you see that like in the browser, the Rick and Morty example, can we really see it, like where is that object actually? You, it's not easy to come across. Like if I, if I sat here and tried to find out where to get it, I'm not going to easily come across it. Based on like a million Rick and Mortys, <laughs> so I'm going to throw it in the local JS object. I believe it's strong in some form of a, it's either a proxy, if you're, if you're familiar with, you know, JavaScript internal. It goes into the browser. It's, it's, in, it's in the browser environment. It's not going out anywhere else, if that makes any sense. And so, like, you can persist that if you wanted to, like, to local storage or whatnot, if you wanted to with one of these um, persisters, these plugins here that he's built out. The, the author of this library. So like you want it in local storage and you can't get it there. Um, but it's definitely not going there by default, I'm pretty sure. Great question. Any more questions? Go ahead. Correct. So like that's a great example. So if I go back over here to invalidate queries, and let's see, do I have my UI so I can get, get so that I can trigger this in the right way. Okay. Let's do state mutation. Okay. And so invalidate queries here. That's not the right one. Invalidate queries will invalidate anything that has this specific query key. Whatever query key I pass to it, it will invalidate. So like if I wanted to invalidate, you know, to do's one. I could do something like this, and if I had whatever key this is in, inside of the browser, it would actually invalidate it and say, go fetch whatever, go make whatever query function is attached to this query key. And so you, this is really powerful because watch this, if I, do, if I did this here, it would, it would invalidate everything that matches this pattern. And so what, what that means is this matches the pattern of to-dos, just a simple array of to-dos. And so like if I'm doing these war, these N plus one API calls and I want to say um, invalidate anything that's a to-do, 
I simply only have to just do that rather than just do the specific piece. Great question. No problem. Another question? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, when you're doing optimistic uh, loading, if you have a lot of functionality that's required that relies on the UUID from the back end, how do you reconcile that? Like, say, if your tools list had an edit button and an edit fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, like, that's a great question. So, essentially, what he's saying, let's say that I did something like this. Where I have an object that has an ID, and I also get some text that's edited. That this item here that says text, all that it is is whatever object that I pass to the mutate function. And so if I pass, or whatever object value that I pass to the mutate function. So if I pass an object with an ID and text, guess what I can do? Where this set queries query data piece is here. I can just go find that item in that array manually with that ID and update it. So like if to-dos had an ID, I could go here and say, oh, to-dos. I could go find that object in that array. This is just me doing some like slow skeleton code for you so you kind of see an example of how to go do that. You can just go find it. Equals XID or whatnot. You will find it. And then once you have that specific to do, you can then come and say, all right, I have this to do. I can map over it or filter based off of it, right? I could even do this guy here. Just do filter all of them where this does not equal that. If I'm talking like old dot, yeah. I could do this guy if I wanted to remove it and then just return it. No problem. Go ahead. I don't think, it, oh, let me pause real quick. Anybody else have any other questions? I'll keep answering his. Okay, go ahead. Um, do you have any tips or best practices for handling the uh, infinite query prop and the sockets? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Great question. Do I have any best practices? No, because I'm not using the infinite queries with web sockets. Um, but I would say likelihood is that what you could do if you have this keep enabled data, or like if you're doing the refetch key, what you could just do with your WebSocket is just listen, while you're listening, just set, just update a specific local state parameter there instead of like trying to trigger all the React query work and then just pass that state parameter to React query and do it that way. Because you, all, you, all you're doing, if you have the default is like enable or keep previous data or like refetch and whatnot, all you need to say is like, if this value changes, then trigger that. No problem. Here. Any more questions? I come back to my friend on the front row because I want to answer. He got some great questions. And he got a, he got a list, so that might help us all. All right, I'm back to you. No worries. I think I kind of think through. I kind of answer it myself. We use React Query, but we don't make a lot of recent use of use mutation. A lot of our forms are, you know, a couple fields in the user submit, so it's even at the time anyway, unnecessary to use, use one mutation, you can just use it with listener and Axios. Um, but that was before I realized that use mutation has some of these other callbacks. Um, so that's a great thing that yeah. I learned for sure. Great. Even if you don't necessarily need them, probably better to have a FOIA like, um, so in case you do want to implement them, they're available. Yep. And so main thing he said is that all these Hooks, they have callbacks, right? Like if something's on, like with use mutation, they have on um, error, on mutate, on success. And if you leverage those callbacks, there are a lot of different powerful things you can start to do. Um, like, you know, with the optimistic updates is a great example there. Um, but those callbacks are really powerful if you decide to leverage them in different ways, like especially when it comes down to error handling. With the React query, you can, you know, have it throw to the nearest error boundary, or you can actually manage your own error handling where you can do this nice little, uh, you could throw the toast 
If anybody else familiar with doing toast on that on, in that own era callback, you can just render a toast. And so this TK Dodo blog here, if you go, he has a bunch of different like entries. There's this React query error handling one that like gives a great example. I'm pretty sure here of using the own error call to do um, to call a toast. So, like I said again, this blog here is OG. It's like, if you want to use React Query, there's all kinds of hints here that like really clear up how it works and can really like take, oh, there's somebody asked about WebSockets with React Query. Item number seven right there, go read it. It's, he, he's a core maintainer of this as well, TK Dodo, so he's going to have a lot more insight into like best usage and some different items with using React Query and all those different cases. So go check out his blog, because it's really good. And if he's listening anywhere, shout out to him and Tanner Lindsley, the people that wrote this. This is a really good library. And it, there's some concerns about React that we don't often think about when we're doing development, but I'm glad that somebody else took the time to think about it besides me, because I'm not this one. All right, well. There's 10 minutes left or nine minutes left. I'm going to close it out there. But if you got questions or you want to stick around or, and hang out, chat with me, I'm here. And um, that's it for me.